Hello and welcome to The View from 22. I'm James Heal and each week on the programme we look at an issue in depth that's dominating the news. Today we're discussing the works of Roald Dahl amid a controversy about sensitivity readers changing his works. I'm joined today by Sam Leith, The Spectator's literary editor. Hello Sam and welcome. Sam, this rouse blew up about a fortnight ago. Can you talk us through how it came to be? Well, there was a fantastic piece of reporting in the Daily Telegraph actually um, by three reporters where they noticed, and I don't know whether they'd been tipped off to it or what had happened, um, but that Roald Dahl's entire canon was being reissued by Puffin, or had been reissued, I think, kind of on the quiet, um, with a huge number of redactions and revisions made in order to take out language and ideas that could be considered offensive or harmful. So, you know, out went fat phobia, out went all sorts of stuff that appeared misogynistic or racist or, you know, even questionable in any way, you know, mental health shaming, you name it, which obviously in Roald Dahl means quite a lot of the material. I mean, my feeling about it, it, it was one of those things that when noticed, it, a lot of people jumped very predictably in a cult, kind of culture war direction. Um, the sort of, those who... I think instinctively we we're always up for cancelling Roald Dahl, not least since, you know, the news of his personal anti-Semitism had, um, you know, massively sort of damaged his reputation. I mean, it didn't damage his reputation as a writer, I don't think, because the, none of that comes through in the books. But, you know, he was considered sort of unwholesome. And there was certainly among people of that, you know, who, who were disposed that way, there was naturally a sense of saying, look, you know, why shouldn't you expunge the, you know, racism, sexism, fat shaming, all that that stuff and make it more politically correct? Because this is, you know, children's literature and, and children need or want protecting from that stuff. At the same time, um, there's obviously an equally strong, you know, outrage against the sort of re revisions from the sort of anti-woke types who said, you know, this is censorship, it's Stalinism, it's the woke Stasi coming to destroy our childhoods, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, oh, well, in fairness, we should note that Dole would absolutely have loathed it. Um, one of the nice developments that's that's come out is the um, that just, just recently, somebody who was actually writing a book about Francis Bacon and following him around with a tape recorder had recorded a conversation drunken conversation between Bacon and Dahl in which both of them talked about what, you know, posterity and whether anyone should change their work after they were dead. And Dahl apparently is incredibly emphatic that he thought, you know, essentially political correctness, as it would then have been called, um, was going to be you know, utterly destructive to his work. And if anyone changed it after his death, um, he would send the enormous crocodile to go and eat them. Um, I mean, the only <laughs> point to make about this maybe is that, you know, tough luck rolled um i mean it notoriously the world doesn't um you know honor the dying wishes of writers and thank god they don't or we wouldn't have notoriously you know virgil or kafka simply both of them wanted their works destroyed on their on their deathbeds um and i mean dahl might have been wise to put a codicil in his will saying you know, if my piece, work is to be published, it needs to be published unaltered. And, you know, maybe that would have been a good thing and maybe that would have been a bad thing. But unfortunately, his relics and children and descendants um, inherited the copyrights and therefore can and did do what they damn well like. And you say there that, you know, these are being done, it seems to be for primarily for moral reasons or, or for the idea that we should teach the children, you know, the right way to think and feel. Because you say that it was done quietly, you know, and that the Telegraph noticed this. This presumably would suggest that it was meant to be done on the sly, as it were, rather than for any kind of commercial or marketing reasons. What, was there any kind of commercial thinking behind this? Is, is this popular? Is this what readers want now? Well, I think I think that's sort of an open question. I mean... Obviously, the Dahl oeuvre, the whole Dahl canon, is a fantastically valuable commercial property. As we know, it was sold to Netflix for absolutely squillions. Um, it should be said, actually, that this, these changes weren't made as a result of the Netflix sale or by Netflix. Um, this revision was kind of 
ongoing at the time the sale was made. You know, it was already it was already in place. Um, so I think the sale to Netflix was twenty twenty one. I think, um, but I think to, to a certain extent, yes, they wanted to future proof the work because they were very aware, for example, Dr. Zeus, um, a, num- a handful of Dr. Zeus's titles were taken out of circulation, were effectively kind of cancelled, so-called, because, you know, there were aspects of them that were, if you like, politically incorrect in ways that were considered offensive and unacceptable. So they they sort of vanished. And I think there's a certain amount of, you know, calculation. They think, you know, we don't want that to happen to Dahl. But the question of whether they were they were intending to kind of, you know, make the books more profitable by making them more, you know, acceptable in the modern age, I think it's sort of harder to say um, because I mean, as you can see from the backlash, almost nobody defended these revisions. Um, quite the opposite. I mean, I, I th- you know, it's one of the cliches of those on the right of the culture wars that you know, go woke, go broke. And certainly that seems to be borne out by the backlash. I mean, Puffin has had a terrible time of it and have basically capitulated. And in the last week or so, I think, have announced that, in fact, they're going to publish the unexpurgated editions alongside the expurgated editions in a kind of classics range. I mean, if I can kind of set out how I see it, I mean, firstly, I think it isn't a kind of complete innovation that there is this anxiety about children's literature shaping children's young minds. Um, Through the whole history of children's literature, adults have been very aware and very conscious and very anxious about what's suitable for children, about the idea, I think, you know, correctly, that what children read can be formative and can shape their worldviews. And that adult anxiety has expressed itself all sorts of ways through history. I mean, you know, notoriously in the sort of earliest flowerings of children's literature in sort of 17th and 18th centuries, it was basically Calvinists um, wrote these really kind of bloody, sanguinary, frightening books um, designed to scare children, you know, towards the church and to repentance of their sins. Um, And there's a sort of inheritance of that kind of Calvinist view I think that's now driving the idea that, you know, there are certain heresies that can't be allowed in children's literature. Um, I think that the revisions, the problem is, even if you were to defend the principle of revising Dahl, and we should say this isn't censorship that's coming from libraries or from the government or from even the um, published particularly, it's, it's the copyright holders are simply reissuing the text. Now, we know that Dahl, when he was alive, you know, as the copyright holder of Charles, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, revised it to make the Oompa Loompas less racist. Um, and so it's the idea that this is a complete work of vandalism that nobody could ever revive these texts that they're sacred seems to me to be kind of nonsense. And it's certainly not a kind of attack on free speech being made by some shadowy institution. You know, it's, it's the dull estate as was and now Netflix that have sanctioned these changes. And of course, as the copyright holder, um, you know, you're entitled to do that. And if we cede the principle that, say, you know, nobody's going to argue too much that it's a, you know, utter work of vandalism on Agatha Christie, say, to revise, to revise the title of her um, notorious novel that became known as And Then There Were, one, there were None, uh, which originally contained the N-word in the title. You know, if you cede the principle that maybe sometimes it might not be the worst thing in the world to revise things, you nevertheless run up in the case of the Dahl estate with the fact that it was done so clumsily and crassly. I mean, it's just been really badly done, even if you accept that maybe having, um, you know, which I don't think can be dismissed out of hand. The idea that if, say, the books contain a lot of language that's, you know, equates directly, you know, being overweight with being disgusting, you know, that that can get fat kids bullied in the playground. And I don't, you know, I, I don't see that necessarily you can dismiss that entirely out of hand. Um, but if you're doing it as crassly as they've done it, you're going to find few defenders. But you mentioned the crassness of it. I also think perhaps one of the reasons why this is such an outcry 
is because it's children's books. You mentioned Agatha Christie. You can think of perhaps other adult works, but this is children's books. And that therefore, people think, well, hang on a sec, is there something sort of slightly sinister here? Not least because, of course, Roald Dahl was so beloved of so many children. And you do have, you've written a lovely article for The Spectator. We have this great line, talk about how Roald Dahl recognises that there's a wickedness in children. Uh, and, you know, he, he has that streak in himself. And so is there perhaps a danger that, you know, by doing it in this way, we therefore kind of make it seem less authentic, even if we try to make them nicer, as it were, for children? Well, I think there's a lot to be unpicked, actually, there. Um, I mean, the idea that it's, you know, it's worse because it's children's books. You know, I think partly the strength of reaction comes from a very adult nostalgia for the books of their own childhood. So, I mean, you know, if if we're saying we'll change language for adult books because, you know, change Agatha Christie, we mostly presumably say adults are more robust to coming across offensive language than children are. So the idea that you'd say, oh, we have to change this for the adults, but oh, children, no, you know, let have it, give them the M word. Um, So I I, I don't think they would be more sacred, um, if you like, the text would be more sacred because they were children's books than because they were adults' books. Um, I think there is a central point though, that it's an adult anxiety, not a childish one. And, the, you know, the reason Dahl seemed to me to be kind of a special case is because Dahl's genius was precisely that kind of adults didn't really like his books because they didn't think they were suitable for children. His books are and were, even in their own generation, denounced as cruel, vulgar, amoral. Um, I mean, Humphrey Carpenter, in his classic study of children's literature, um, says he he says he thinks Dahl was basically amoral. I mean, I take a different view. I think Dahl was fiercely moral, but he was kind of medieval in his morality. He was, you know, he, his world was one in which which children such, took such delight. You know, adults who weren't nice to children were subject to incredible violent vengeance, which children bloody love. And, you know, the violence and aggression and you know, glee that Dahl takes in the, you know, sticky ends to which his villains come is what what makes them so appealing to children. And I could make the point also that the idea of sort of trying to make things nice for children so as to protect their young minds is something children instinctively resist. Um, I mean, notoriously, I think, you know, when I was a kid, um, this, what, what was then called the Spastic Society changed its name to Scope because spastic was um, a playground insult. And of course, what did children do? They started calling each other scopers. You know, it, the, the, the children's cruelty can get around the adults, um, around the adults kind of attempt to protect them, you know, every single time. I think children are, are nastier, as Dahl recognised, than adults like to admit. And so much of... Roald Dahl's material is kind of feeding into that, is playing into that. And as I say, he's sort of medieval in the way that, again, you know, it's, he, he equates, as, you know, fairy tales do, physical beauty with moral beauty. Now, we've got a problem with that in our own generation. We don't like to fat shame people. We don't like to say that, that people are ugly. And particularly, we don't like this idea, um, which obviously is quite you know, unfounded in real life that, you know, the goodies are all beautiful and the uglies are all wicked and bad and ugly and fat and evil. Um, and yet that goes through Dahl absolutely like a stick of rock. So in Charlie and the fa- Chocolate Factory, you know, there is no way to change the story sufficiently so that Augustus Gloop is not a fat kid. Augustus Gloop is gluttony in a kind of medieval morality play incarnation. He gets stuck in a chocolate tube, um, you know. So, so the sort of um, the rewriters in this case, the sensitivity readers, they went, "Oh, we can't call him fat, so we're going to call him enormous." And elsewhere, they have, you know, they they took out. They said, oh, "We can't call people mad because you know that's mental health shaming, so we'll have to change it to out of your mind," which, you know. <laughs> This week. So I mean, the, trouble, the trouble is a lot of this stuff is at absolutely pavement level in Dahl. And, 
you, you can't really extract it. And so I just want to, can you put some sort of context, some wider context here on sensitivity readers? Because I think this is the first time that a lot of people will have come across this. How recent is this as an innovation? Obviously, we've always seen kind of rewrites and, and things like forwards, but it used to be the case, you know, you'd have an updated forward to a book trying to kind of contextualize. This seems to be uh, a sort of slightly new innovation or perhaps a new spin on things. Can you just sort of say how wide this practice is and whether it's kind of reserved for the most famous books, presumably they're the most commercial and sell the most, so people want to update them, or, or whether this is going to be something they're going to see more of in the future? I can't speak for the publishing industry. Um as a whole, I think it's it's wide, it's fairly widespread in large trade publishers. It's becoming more so. I think it's particularly common in children's and young adult literature. For some reason, the, the sort of ideological cancel culture rows that go on seem to be really at their fiercest in young adult literature. And the idea of a sensitivity reader essentially is it's someone who goes through a text looking for ways in which the text might be offensive um it will talk, they will look at ways in which an author who might be writing a character or a situation that's outside their own experience and here's one of the you know big points of contention about this because fiction writers will say well look our job is to make stuff up um whereas sensitivity readers will tend to say look you've you know produced say a Native American character, and you've got them wearing a war bonnet, and that's that's not cool because they'd only wear these in certain circumstances. Or this is, you know. um, and these get caricatured as kind of, you know, politically correct censorship. All this, I think, again, as with Dahl rewrites, it depends a bit how it's done. I mean, you say are sensitivity readers new? Well, not really. When George Eliot wrote Daniel Deronda, she went to a rabbi and she said, "Look, I'm writing a book about Jewish people." Um, you know more about this subject than me. Can you, you know, read my manuscript and tell me whether I've got it right? Um, and you know, so from in some senses, being a sensitivity reader shouldn't be a kind of bogeyman. It's simply an extension of the function that any good editor does, which is to say, look, you've got the wrong Russian phrase here, or if you write this in a certain way, it is going to look crass. But as I say, the culture wars being as they are, the issue has been kind of absolutely dragged deep into it. And of course, the other story that's come out now is that the James Bond books are going to have uh, racial uh, phrases moved from, removed from them. I mean, how different is that row from this row? And I, I just wonder perhaps if you can see other books are likely to be caught up in this as well. I know you can't speak for the publishing industry, Sam, but I just, you know, do you think that... This is going to be see something we see more of in terms of those books which are popular in the mid to late twentieth century, perhaps. I th well, I don't know. I mean, I think there is a, you know, particularly with adult books. Um, my instinct as a reader and as a kind of critic is, I think we basically, for the most part, ought to leave them alone because, you know, you really are slightly erasing the history of the canon, and partly there's a sort of sort of, of what's left. Um, in that, I mean, I, I'm working at the moment on a book about children's literature and the history of children's literature, and I was kind of astounded and dismayed by how right up into the 80s and, I mean, not quite the 90s, but well into the 80s, there was a sort of casual racism and othering, which would be, you know, very shocking to readers now in all the books. And, you know, we're talking about, I mean, this morning, you know, I've been working away hard reading Wind in the Willows, right? Wind in the Willows, this sort of absolute paragon, a kind of Edwardian innocence. And yet when Toad, when he's on the run from, you know, having broken out of jail, he has a run in with a barge woman who's barging a barge along the river and they fall out with each other. And he denounces her as a common fat barge woman with mottled arms. Um, and like, you know, the, the Charlie and the Chocolate people would be, Charlie the Chocolate Factory rewriters would be going through that like a dose of salts. Throughout the 19th century and early 20th century, even in quite progressive children's writers, you know, you'd think of E. Nesbitt, you know, she's a Fabian, she's kind of a very, you know, she's not like sort of mad imperialist G.A. Henty, you know, she's, she's considered sort of a very forward-looking children's writer. But they're absolutely stuffed with kind of, you know, anti-Semitic and racial stereotypes with kind of really 
sort of class snobbery. I mean, you know, in, in the Samiad, there's a run in with a butcher's boy who's just a completely innocent character who's basically duffed up by the main characters. And he's, he clearly doesn't count as, as fully human as the nice middle class children. So if you go through unpicking and rewriting everything, um, I think you aren't going to be left with all that much. I mean, with the Bond books, there's some pretty dodgy stuff in that. I mean, it's actually not the racism, but misogyny generally that's the problem with Bond. I mean, there's that notorious line about the tang of rape approvingly noted in a room. Um, and again, I tend to think, I can see the case for, you know, it doesn't hurt to take out some of the, you know, <laughs> some of the more racist or fat phobic stuff in Dahl, if you can, which is hard, um, you know, in the hopes that this maybe makes makes the lives of slightly overweight children in school playgrounds a bit easier. I think when you start kind of running a comb through the adult canon, you are, I mean, I, I hate to sound like a culture warrior, but, you know, you're erasing literary history, or at least making it it harder to, you know, see how how these original artifacts are. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Appreciate you joining us today on Spectator TV.